Hey, let's make a multiplayer game in Unreal. It's quite easy to get started. Obviously, it gets complicated pretty quick, but I find that getting your foot in the door is often the most important part, because after that you can sort of look up what you need specifically rather than just aimlessly watching thousands of hours of tutorials. So let's turn this single player uh, prototype into a multiplayer prototype. Don't worry, it's pretty straightforward. Click here, change the number of players to more than one, change the net mode to client. I recommend launching in PIE mode so you can see what's going on. There we are. We now have two clients, and we are officially in multiplayer mode. We now have two players. Obviously, they're both local. There's nobody calling in from the internet or anything. But this is already enough for us to do a lot of development. This is all we need to get started. From here, we can develop all of the multiplayer stuff we're going to need. But there were some other options. You might have noticed that I chose client rather than as listen server. A lot of people recommend listen server. Don't. Don't do that. Obviously, eventually, if you are creating a listen server, someone that's both hosting and playing, yeah, you're going to want to switch it over. But when you're just getting started, you're going to want everybody to be as client. I've just switched us over to listen server and look, here's the server and here's the client. The server is also a player, which means that we can run and we can stretch, and we can do a lot of the single player things that we were able to do before. But the client, when we stretch, the server doesn't see it. And if we try and run, we get this weird jitter. Playing as the server is completely different than playing as the client. So in order to keep yourself from accidentally testing things as the server, I strongly recommend that you do it in client mode. Obviously, you may eventually want to switch over to listen server when you're doing things like setting up matches for the UI for setting up matches and stuff. But for testing your basic functionality, it's better to be bulletproof. If everybody is a client, you can't accidentally mistakenly test things as the server. So now that everybody is the client, we can see that both sides can't do the things they're supposed to be able to do. We can stretch, but they can't see us stretch. We can't run, and of course it's the same on the other side. Because everybody's equal. Everybody's a client. But why don't those things work? Oh, that's replication. So this is definitely the thing that is going to give you the most grief. Let's go over how replication works, because this is the number one most critical thing for you to understand. Let's talk about stretching. Oh look, here it is. So here is our stretch command. You can see that we just set a stretch variable. That's it. And then our animation blueprint picks up on the fact that there's a stretch variable and adjusts. So all we have to do is replicate this, right? Wait, wait, that, that fuzzy dice, the fuzzy things in the corner here, these little dangly things, that means it's replicated. I already set this to replicated. Look, replicated. It's not working. Oh, no. Oh, that's not a big deal. Replication always goes from the server to the client. We're setting stretching locally on our client. The client never replicates to the server. The server never even knows that we've set this stretching variable. Because replication only goes out from the server. So what we need to do is tell the server to change this variable. And we do that using what's called a remote process call. It's just a custom event. Here it is. You can name it whatever you want, but I strongly recommend starting with RPC so you can search for it. This is a custom event, though, not a remote process call. What's the magic to turn it into a remote process call? There, now it's a remote process call. Market is reliable. Easy peasy. All we have to do now is set this variable on the server. Now we call this. Come on. There we are. That's it. That's all we needed. We tell it to call RPC request, request stretch. This is a server side event that changes a variable. The variable is set to replicate. See, right there. 
So that means that when the server changes the variable on the server, the server says, hey, everybody, I changed a variable. You're going to want to change it too. The server has ultimate authority. All of the things that need to be changed should be changed on the server. And that's pretty much the basics. So now, if I were to take this character over and stretch, look, we can both see the stretching. And of course, if we switch characters, we can still both see the stretching because the server replicates it properly. The server is making the change and then the server is replicating the value. That's the basis of replication. It goes out from the server. So you need to make the change on the server. How about sprinting? That sprinting situation was a little strange, right? Why is it doing this jittering? What's that? So what's happening there is that we are setting our max walk speed to something very high locally on the client. And then when we simulate it locally on the client, we realize that we have quite a bit of speed left and we accelerate past what speed we're currently going. The server says, you can't go that fast. I have your max speed set at 120 centimeters per second. So there's no way you can be going 160. And we say, oh shit. And then the server says, this is how fast you're going and this is where you are. And so we get that jitter and we get a little bit of teleporting going on. It's very, very fast on a local situation like this, but if you were doing an actual internet multiplayer, that could be like a full second of delay between our attempts to run and the server telling us that we couldn't. Now, the server doesn't know that we changed our max walk speed. The server doesn't understand that because it's not going to be replicated upwards. So all the server really understands is that we are moving illegally fast. It could be for any reason. That's why the server just silently says, nope, you can't go that fast. Go back to where you should be. Obviously, the solution is to tell the server to change our maximum walk speed, at which point it will tell us that our maximum walk speed changed. Oh, look, here it is. Here's us setting it locally. Character movement set max walk speed. And here it is on the server. Here is the server request. Change the max walk speed. Here's what we call the server request. Pretty simple, right? So now we should be able to sprint. Yay, we can sprint. It sprints for everybody. Everything works. It's perfect. Except I sort of glossed over one tiny little thing. There's an extra little node. Look, right here. We didn't need that down here. We didn't use that down here. Why didn't we use that down here? Well, here's the reason latency. See, running this stretch animation really doesn't matter very much. If it runs a second slow or a quarter second slow, who cares, right? But when it comes to setting our max speed, the simulation is going to get constantly updated. If we tell the server, just the server, to update it and we don't update it locally, then what we get is this. See that little hiccup? What's happening there is that at, say, 400 milliseconds, we say, server, we would like our max speed to be three times higher than what it currently is. And at 400 milliseconds, the server says, OK, I have re received a request to increase your max speed uh, from 100 milliseconds ago. So here you have been traveling at a new max speed for 100 milliseconds already. This is where you should be. This is how fast you should be going. Then the client receives that 100 milliseconds after that and teleports to wherever they should be going the speed that the server says they should be going. So it's the same problem we had when we set it locally, except for now it's backwards. Instead of moving too fast, we're moving too slow. That's why we set it locally and on the server. We set it locally and we tell the server that they should set it. That way both sides end up in sync and there's no jitter. This is something that's handled automatically by a lot of packages. For example, the, uh, the gameplay ability package does this automatically, so you don't have to suffer through this. But if you're doing this manually, you do need to be careful about this sort of latency. If the server does something, you need to understand whether you need to do it locally at the same time just to be sure that you're always going to be synced up or what. So yes. We set this value locally and on the server, just so that everybody is in sync, regardless of their latency.
Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between replicated variables and RPCs. You might have noticed that we have different materials here. That's fine. We have different materials, so if I set that up so that we change materials when we stretch, it works, right? Look at this. But you might have noticed that we have a random material when we start. That's actually something that requires a little bit of delicacy. Here it is. Event begin play. Your pain. Because not all players start at the same time. Putting aside players that start late for an actual reason, even if you try and start all players at the same time, it's going to take them a couple of frames of difference at the very least. So, if I change my material using an RPC call, and I multicast that RPC call out to everybody that could be listening, well, it could very well be that nobody else is listening because nobody else has spawned in yet. RPCs don't go out to everybody that will ever exist. They go out to everybody who's listening. Even if you set the RPC as uh, you know, a required RPC, here, a reliable RPC, this is reliably sent to everybody that's currently online. It doesn't get propagated to players that spawn in 10 seconds later. So you have to be careful when you're running these because these will not affect people that are not online. So you might see people who are using things like multicasts. Be very careful with multicasts because they only affect people that are online. What we're doing instead is we are using a variable. We have this chosen material variable here. We've set it up to rep notify. Rather than replicated, we have rep notify. Replicated just sets the variable from the server. So the server says, here's the value of the variable, that's it. Rep notify says, here's the value of the variable, and I hear you have a function you should call. Oh, look, here it is. It automatically gets created. Ah, oh, look, chosen material, set material on the mesh. Rep notify. We can also do that with anything we want. Here, run speed. Rep notify. There it is, on rep run speed. So this is one of those things where it can be extremely valuable to understand how to use a rep notify because if I log in 10 minutes late, the server says, okay, I know you're late, but here is everybody that's in the scene. Here's all the people you need to know about. Here's player one. Here's where they are. Here's how fast they're moving. By the way, they have this custom variable called chosen material, and it has been changed to this. I hear you have a function you should call. There's no RPC involved. It just works. So if you are running into situations where your RPCs don't seem to be reaching players because they're not currently accessible for some reason or another, think very strongly about setting it up using variable replication because variable replication is much more resilient. Now, obviously all of this is just to get you started. There are a million other factors that you can worry about and optimize, and people are going to probably be down in the comments, uh, assuming that this video gets any views, talking about different ways of approaching things. But this should get you started. This is the beating heart of your multiplayer, replicating values and RPCs. I hope you learned something. See ya.